Hey guys, before we jump into the video, I just wanted to come on here and say thank you so much for your support on my channel and with these videos, especially my testimonial videos that I've recently started. This is the fifth testimonial video that I've done, so I'm really excited for you guys to see. And I just wanted to say it helps me out so much when you like these videos, when you subscribe to my channel, share these videos, and support me on Patreon. I really, really appreciate it. So we're just about to watch Andrew's testimony. I'm so excited for you guys to see this, and I really pray that this video blesses you. When I walked in and he closed the jail cell door, I could hear it clank. I literally dropped down on my knees and I cried out to God, is this who I am? Is this all I was meant to do for the rest of my life? I grew up in a Christian household. My mom and my dad are actually both pastors and so I really grew around the body of church and so growing up you know I witnessed my parents going out evangelizing you know leading the church developing the church planting the church um, traveling to different countries um, different places to help set up um, and so I know what it's like to, to be in the body of church uh, but the one thing is that you know as a as a PK or a pastor's kid you know you grew up Hearing the Word of God, you grow up hearing about the Bible, you grow up hearing about Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, you hear about God um, and all the goodness. And all of it sounds really good, but behind closed doors, things are different, you know? Um, people within the church will talk foul about each other, they'll talk behind each other's back, um, they won't support each other, they'll just judge each other. And you know, in the Bible it says, those without sin will cast the first stone. And so... I always thought to myself, you know, like, how can you really cast stone at your brothers and sisters of Christ? If this is what the body of Christ is supposed to be like, it's so broken. And so me as a child, not knowing, I judged the church. I judged religion. And um, from that kind of point of view, it kind of steered me away from the idea of being a Christian. I remember when I was seven years old, this is where I first encountered God. And for some reason, he moved in my heart. And out of nowhere, for the first time, I'm like, God, you know what? I'm going to give my life to you, and I'm going to accept your son, Jesus Christ, as my Lord and Savior. At seven years old. You know, at the time, I really didn't understand that as well, but something in my heart moved me to say that. And so, when I said that, we were in worship. My eyes all of a sudden closed and seven years old I just raised my hand. And the whole time, you know, like leading up to that point, I was like, oh, I never want to raise my hand. It's too nerve wracking. But I closed my eyes and I raised my hand. and I just felt the Holy Spirit just land on me. And I felt this peace I've never felt before in my life. And I felt this overwhelming love. And then a prophetic vision came upon me. And that vision was me standing on a stage, looking out, and seeing the most beautiful stars. And at that age, I really didn't understand, but in my heart, I knew what the call was. I don't believe I'm worthy of it. And number two, you know, I see what it's like to, to lead and run a church, and it's not easy. And from that, I just rebelled growing up. Like, I felt like I just had so much to prove because I was always the smallest kid. <laughs> and growing up like that, having, feeling like you have so much to prove, you would do anything that would make you fit into what was cool or socially acceptable. And I always tried to be the cool kid all the time. And I thought being the cool kid, you had to have all the cool things so that people would think that you were cool or dress the coolest ways. Going into high school, you know, being this troubled kid, having all the things I had because I stole them all, People perceived me the way I wanted them to perceive me. And so, you know, I, I had, it's interesting, it's funny because like, I had girls I never thought that wanted to talk to me or, or, or hang out with me, hang out with me and want to talk to me. And I was like, oh, this stuff is working. So I'm like, okay, if this is working, then, you know, all these friends that came out of nowhere, these, these cool kids that were like known as the popular kids, um, wanted to be around me too. And I was like, oh man, if this is all working, then what else can we do? 
And then it led me to like going into the mall and like stealing merchandise from all the stores. And you know, once a hustler, always a hustler. But I was simply a hustler without a kingdom mindset. And so I just wanted to make something for myself. And I would steal all these clothes and sell them and make money. And then all of a sudden, all that money, I was like, okay, what can I do to now to invest it to make more money? And then I started to invest it into buying like weed because at the time it was really cool. And if you had access to cool things, obviously you're going to become a cool kid. And so I was selling weed at a very young age. And then all of a sudden, ecstasy hit the market. And I started to sell ecstasy. And, you know, everything was working out the way I wanted to. And then, obviously, as you start to go down this path, it leads down to something even deeper. And out of nowhere, you know, I remember hanging out at my house. My friend called me. He's like, hey, what are you doing right now? I'm like, oh, I'm just hanging out. It's like, I'm gonna come pick you up. I'm like, what? You don't even have your license. He's like, don't even worry about it. Comes by, picks up in our van. I hop in the van, we start driving around. And then he tells me I actually stole this car. I'm like, oh, what? And in my mind, I'm like, oh, that's, that's terrible. But then I'm like, oh, that's cool, you know? Within my heart, I knew it wasn't good, but the mentality I was is like, I'm gonna do whatever I can to fit in. It led, from one thing led to another. We kept stealing more and more cars. And then I remember one time we were, we were, hot wiring a Civic. And then my friend was in the driver's side seat, you know, trying to hot wire the vehicle and I was sitting in the passenger side seat. And uh, I was just rummaging through this stuff just to see if there's anything valuable. And then out of nowhere, I see this like car, no lights, nothing, just creep up and I can just hear its tires like, and then it just stops. And I look at it, I'm like, oh man, that's a cop. <laughs> I'm like, what should we do? He's like, I have no idea. And so when the silence came on, my instinct was to just run. And so I opened the door and I just book it. And all of a sudden I hear in the back, he's like, we got K9, stop. And I'm like, I don't care, I'm gonna run. <laughs> and then I remember hopping a fence and I thought hopping the fence would be enough. I hid under a bush. And then I, all of a sudden I hear this like, this scruffling and the, the dog's paws are running and I'm like, oh no. And then I just, dives right into the bush where I'm at and it bites me right on the butt and I have this huge bite mark and the scar to prove it and then I just was screaming and then the cop is like don't move don't move I'm like I'm not I'm not I can't move and then they got the dog off of me and you know they they, they arrested me and they're like okay well because you're underage because you're only 14 you have a choice either you go to jail or you call your parents and in my mind I'm like oh man I don't want to go to jail and I don't want to call my parents, but I'd rather call my parents. My dad came and picked me up. And if you know Asian parents, you know, if they say nothing to you, you know you're in trouble. And my dad, when he picked me up, didn't even look me in the eyes, didn't say a single word to me. Only drove me home, got out of the car, went in the house, went downstairs, and I guess he went to bed or he was just pondering or reflecting or thinking to himself, man, what did I go wrong? I remember going home and I felt so terrible. And so I still didn't reprimand any of that. I still wasn't a good child. I still kept rebelling because it was my, in my spirit that, I was, that, that, that was upon me at that moment. And I remember this one time, my dad and I got into a physical altercation, like physical fist fight. And it was at that point, he's like, you have to listen to me, you're in my house. I'm like, if you think I'm in your house, if you think I'm gonna stay in your house because of this, I'll prove to you otherwise. And he's like, if you're gonna stay in my house, you gotta listen to my rules. I'm like, then I won't stay in your house. I literally ran away from home. And being an Asian kid in Vancouver, you know, you go to the one place that, 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 that makes you feel like you have a home. You, you make you feel like they are family and that's the gangs. They allowed me to really excel. They made me feel like I was a part of them. They made me feel invincible. They made me feel powerful beyond measure. I, I had everything and anything I could like ever imagine. Like I had boxes full of cash. I had access to all different cars. I'm pulling up into my high school in like this BMW convertible. And I felt like the coolest kid. And I was like, oh yeah, check me out now guys. And I remember one time doing what I was doing, you know, there's, there's always other gangs out there. And I was being robbed at one point. This is a true testament to his to his, to his covering. And one of the guys had a knife to my neck. And the other guy was rummaging through my car, looking for all the drugs and the money. 
And then they got everything, like, where's everything else? I'm like, this is all I have. I got nothing left. And because of another gang, they were like, if you guys, you know, try to come after us, we know who you are. We'll come kill you. I was like, yeah, okay. And then to make a point, he wanted to, he, he, he took his knife, the guy who was sitting beside me, he took his knife, and he came down right on my leg. And the moment the blade touched my leg, I flinched and I went, ah! The blade snapped and broke off the handle. And I looked at my leg, there was no piercing, no cut. And then I looked at him, and then he's like, what? I'm like, I have no idea. He threw the, knife, he threw the handle down and he's like, remember, we know who you guys are. If you come after us, we'll come after you. Left the car, stabbed all my tires and drove off. And I thought to myself there, I'm like, man, what did I just get into? And I'm like, man, I, I didn't even connect it, that it was God that was protecting me in the moment. I just thought, man, I'm so lucky. But at the end of every night, I remember sitting at the edge of my bed, thinking to myself, is this it? Because I got everything I thought I wanted to prove to everybody that I was cool. But even having it all, I was like, there's got to be more. What, what, like, there's no fulfillment in it. And the funny thing is when you ask yourself good questions, good answers will follow. And literally two days out from being initiated into the gang, and if you know anything about a gang, when you get initiated, you got to do something to prove your loyalty. But two days out, you know, we, I'm out doing what I'm doing, and I'm going through a sale just like normal. Asked him all the right questions, got everything down, made the sale, drove off. Remember it was at Metrotown. I drove by Uncle Willie's and I was like, oh man, that place looks good, I'm gonna eat there tonight. I pull up to the red light, I'm just sitting there and all of a sudden, these cop cars just swarm me. Everybody jumps out, puts their gun to my face or, or to the car and they're like, freeze! And just like when <laughs> I was stealing a car and they yelled, we got K-9, running off. I didn't freeze in that moment, I drove off. And then I was on this high speed chase. And I remember looking in the rear view mirror and seeing every inch of that rear view mirror being blocked by red and blue lights. I thought to myself, man, we're not gonna get away from this. And then I decided to pull over, throw my hands out the window because I know that's what they were gonna make me do. All the cars just ram into me and I'm like, Phew. they jump out, pull me out of the car and just slam me on the ground and I went under concussion. And then when I woke up, there was a cop's knee on my neck. Some of the cops were just swearing at me like, you just almost ran us over. Guns to my head, like it was a lot. And then when they processed me, brought me into you know the holding cell, I remember sitting in there thinking to myself, oh, this is whatever, you know. To put into context, I've been over arrested at least like 20 times by this time. And they've always let me out. So when they opened the cell door to bring me in to question me, they're like, okay, so they asked me all these questions. After they asked me all these questions, I look the cop dead in the eyes. I'm like, okay, so when are you gonna let me out? The cop looks at me, he's like, we're not, you're going straight to prison for two to 10 years. And then all of a sudden it dawned upon me like a veil was lifted. If I continue down the life I'm on right now, I'm gonna end up either dead or in jail for the rest of my life. And when he brought me back to the holding cell, and I can still hear it now as I say this, when I walked in and he closed the jail cell door, I can hear it clank. I literally dropped down on my knees and I cried out to God, is this who I am? Is this all I was meant to do for the rest of my life? And I heard his voice tell me no. And it was in that moment that in my heart, I made a decision and a covenant. But at the time, I didn't know it was God. But I was like, if I get out of this, I'm never going back to it again. And the moment I made that covenant, all of a sudden I hear the door open. No one would lie, it was wild. And the officer who arrested me came in and said, okay, we're gonna let you go. I looked at him like, what? I thought you said I'm going straight to prison for two to 10 years. He's like, we decided to let you go. Obviously he wasn't happy about it. But when he let me out, processed me, everything, 
and I had nowhere else to go. Because mind you, I've never, I didn't talk to my parents for two years as I was doing this. And so something in my heart was like, just call your parents. And when I called my parents, like this is where I realized that no, no matter how far gone you were as a child, your parents will always love you, always. And even though I forsake them, I called them, I told them, hey, look, this is what I'm doing right now. And this is what I'm involved in. And I want to leave. But if I leave, they're going to come looking for me. And they know where we live. And if they don't find me, they're going to come after you. And if they don't find any of us, they'll burn our house down. And I know this firsthand. And I remember my mom saying, Don't worry, just come home. We'll deal with it then. And that's when it like hit me. That's when I realized what true unconditional love really meant. That's what a true mighty woman of God who knows God's heart, who knows his love for us will always love you no matter what. And then from there, I started to change. I started to transform. And I started to really be more open and expressive and welcoming. And I started to smile more. And I started to welcome people into my life. And, you know, that's really not the end of the story because from that discovery, you know, I, I still had to grow and, and, and evolve into many different things during that time as well from that season until now, uh, I went through, you know, alcohol addiction. I went through um, drug addiction. Like I was, I was addicted to ecstasy. Um, I even just came out of an, like this, this addiction of uh, psilocybin or mushrooms that I didn't even know I had. Um, but from that season, I kind of entered a new one. And that new season um, was personal growth and development. And it lead, led me to this spiritual awakening. It led me to this idea of, I am divine, like, I am a God within myself. And that's kind of like what I thought before too. I'm like, man, if God created us, then a piece of God is in us. And if a piece of God is in us, then I am a God too. And so it really spoke to this part of myself. And so diving into the stuff, it was really cool because I realized that I could with the law of attraction, I could attract things into my life. I could create abundance if I thought a certain way or project certain things. If I began to visualize, you know, all these uh, amazing like things that I wanted in my life. And so, yeah, a lot of it did happen. I mean, I created great success from it. And the more I dove into this new age spirituality, the more I became kind of narcissistic in a way. I became very judgmental. Oh, my vibes need to be high. Your vibes are low. We can't hang out. My frequency is higher than yours. You know, I'm trying to bring you up to here, but you want to stay down there? No, nah, we can't do that. Here's a crystal. Take this crystal. Hopefully this crystal can help you heal. <laughs> Read this book. Hopefully this book can help change your mind. But it came to a place again, like I remember sitting at a fire and this feeling came over me and it was a, a heavy energy. I was like, whoa, what is this? You know? So man, I'm surrounded with these good people, these good energy. We're doing what we're meant to be doing. We're in campfire. We gave it up to Source Universe to get us to where we're at right now. Like, why is it that I feel this way? I never told anybody this. But I asked myself that question. Is there something more? Is there something greater? And I remember a week passed by. And all of a sudden, I get this message, this weird message. It's like one of my friends, she's like, Andrew, I need to talk to you. I'm like, yeah, OK, what's up? It's like, no, I can't talk to you over the phone. I need to talk to you in person. I feel like I've been deceiving you. Like, what do you mean, <laughs> deceiving me? <laughs> she was serious about this. And then she's like, we need to meet. So I remember the day that we met, she comes in, she's all nervous. I'm like, oh, what's going on? She's like, why is she so nervous? But there's something different about her. There's something very different about her. And I couldn't put my finger on it. And she's like, so nervous. She's like moving around and shifting. She's like, okay. I could see it in her face. She's like. I don't know how to tell you this. I'm like, tell me what? She's like, I accepted God. 
into my life. I'm like, oh, cool. She's like, no, like Andrew, I accepted Jesus Christ as my savior. I'm like, that's amazing. She's like, what? I'm like, that's so good because she had no idea that um, I uh, grew up in a Christian household. She had no idea that my mom and dad were pastors. And so we never spoke about it because all we did was spoke about like new age spirituality. We spoke about spiritual teachings. We spoke about Buddhism, Taoism, like all these different things to like lead us to this ascension. So she, we never really spoke about God because in new age spirituality, we thought Jesus as this like master ascender. And so she's like blown away. She's like, oh, you're not mad? I'm like, no, why would I be mad? I'm happy for you. She shared me her testimony, and I was like, oh, that's amazing. I was like, you know what? I'll come to church with you. She's like, what? I'm like, yeah, I'll come to church with you. She's like, okay. My whole life, I'm telling you, like, God has always brought me back to him, no matter how far gone I was. During all those seasons that I was in, so for some reason, I would always go back to church. But I'd always step away because once I received the healing, and once I received something, I'm like, nah, man, like, I can do it better without God. My own ignorance, and I'd wander off into the wild. For the first time in my life, when I walked into Love Quest International Church, for the first time in my life, I walked in, I was like, huh. And mind you, I've been in many churches, many churches. But there was something so different about these people. There was so much joy in what they did. There was so much love in worshiping and serving God. I'm like, what is going on? And I can feel sitting down that there was something in the atmosphere that I could put my finger on at the time. But even after that, I walked away from it. And I was processing everything because remember this, like I put so much of my identity in what I did and how I did what I did. And that was in the New Age spiritual practices. Like I've learned from so many different spiritual teachers. I've done tarot card readings. I've done like meditations. I've done like guided meditations. I've used hypnosis. I've you know done light therapy sound baths. I've done retreats where like these spiritual um, teachers did healing over me, like chakra clearing. So like, I think like eight to 10 years of my life was dedicated to this. And I'm like, why is it that I feel in my heart now that God is the truth, the way and the light? Why do I feel that Jesus Christ is truly my Lord and Savior? I was questioning so much of it. And I was so confused for so long. And then all of a sudden, my heart really began to shift. And then God began to really come in. And he moved in me. And then I went to church again with Anna. And I remember being in that service. And I realized what was different about that atmosphere is that the Holy Spirit was there. And when he moved in me, that love I told you I felt with my mom, I felt it in that house. And I was like, God, if you're real, if you're real, show me. And he did. And when he showed me, he showed me in a way that was so subtle and so small. And how he showed me that was when I was working on a client. And as I was working on her, I shared my, my encounter with God. And she's like, Andrew, I, I couldn't pinpoint it, but I have to say there's something different about you. Because normally when we work together, like I always loved you and I always appreciated everything that you do. But for the first time in my life, I feel loved by you. And to me, that was a confirmation that when, when I reopened up my heart to God, that His love was pouring through me in ways I couldn't even explain. And so, when I went back to church, they announced that they were going to do a baptism again. And I was like, if I'm going to commit, I'm going to commit. If I'm going to go back into this, I'm going to go all in. So the idea of jumping with both feet in, I literally jumped both feet in and I said, I'm going to get baptized again. 
And I remember when it was time to do the baptism, I stood on the water. And God just really moved in my heart at that time. I raised my hand and I just closed my eyes. The Holy Spirit was upon me and I heard him tell me, welcome home. And then you're forgiven. Like God only knows all the things that I've done. But when I heard that voice, I felt like this warm blanket of love come over me. As I was coming out of the water, I see my mom. And she's crying like I've never seen her cry before. And I'm like, why would she be crying right now? But I realized her cries are from all of her bruised knees from being on the ground, from all her nights praying for her son. The reason why I was so protective was not only because God was tethered to me, but because my mom never gave up on me. She always prayed for me. And it was in that moment when I got baptized that her relentless prayers were answered. Nothing filled my heart. Nothing moved me the way it was moved that day when I saw that. I'm like, I'm gonna delight in being an obedient son. Because if that's how my mom is, when she sees her son come back to Christ, I can't wait to see what it's like when I answer the call that God has upon my life. For everybody who's watching this right now, breaking the spirit of religion. It's not about religion. It's truly about a relationship, a one-on-one -on -one connection you have with God. A lot of what we do is based on the word because in the word there's a lot of truth. And for everybody who's watching right now who's into personal growth and development, who's into like all these different books of like emotions, spirituality, I'm telling you, you can throw all of those books out and put the word of God right on your mantle.